thing. This one doesn't go down, eh? Or do I have to push harder? Oh, okay. Wait, Lefty Lucy. Or, there it is. Dang. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, last Sunday of February, we're finally on to March soon, next week. Uh, before we start, let's go to a word of prayer and then we can begin. So let's pray. Uh, God, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Uh, Father, we were grateful for the weather today. Um, really bad on Tuesday, but um, I'm glad everyone's safe today. And Lord, I just pray for, for your word today, that you'll speak through it. God, I pray we have an encounter with you, an experience with you in our hearts and in our minds, Lord. And I pray we leave this place challenged and also encouraged. Um, fathers, just speak to us today. In your name we pray. Amen. So during the pandemic, uh, like everyone else, I was stuck at home. Um, everything was closed. I would go to drive throughs Like that would probably be like the, the thing day, I guess. I would go to Tim Hortons or whatnot. And it was the only thing that was open. But everything else on TV was like, Canceled. There was like no sports, and it, it, it sucked. You know, sometimes I would just stay and I just want to watch a game, but everything was shut down. So I was excited when it was that they were releasing a documentary called The Last Dance. I'm like, all right, it's not about a dance, but it's more about a basketball team, a team that I watched when I was a kid. The Chicago Bulls, they ruled most of the 90s. And it was intriguing. The documentary was intriguing to me because of all the characters. The characters, they were all so different. What was good is that they were so different that they clashed with one another. And it, and it made the, this whole dramatic story we got Michael Jordan arguably I suppose the greatest the goat who said it arguably the greatest to play the game when you walk documentary he's super intense he's crazy like you like manic out the game Ultra competitive, on and off the court, ultra competitive that he was so hard to be around, he would literally fight, like punch his teammates. He would verbally abuse his teammates and the coaching staff. Then we got Dennis Rodman with his hair of different colors, an amazing rebounder. You know, he's, he's only 6'9", but he can rebound the ball really well. But it was his personal life. Party animal with Madonna and Carmen Electra. I don't know if anyone remembers those guys, but girls, I mean. Escapades, you know, they were showing one episode and it's just like, it's just so interesting to watch, engaging. And then we got Scottie Pippen, mostly considered the sidekick to Jordan, Hall of Fame player as well. But eventually that team of greatness was broken up by drama, was broken up by politics, yet they were able to overcome each other's flaws. They were able to overcome differences to win championships, to create this Great story. They were able to come around a common mission. This is kind of like a metaphor of a good church. That we are all different. Different mannerisms, different temperaments, different cultures. We all come with different baggage. But 
if we can overcome differences and unite in a deep way, we can do amazing things for God, make great friends along the way, part of this bigger family. But there are two sins, two kinds of sins that prevent us from experiencing this deep unity or end friendship. And the first kind of sin is religious sin. The kinds of sins demonstrated by the Pharisees in the Bible. You read the Bible, the Pharisees were like religious snobs, condescending. They would look down on people. They thought they were better than everyone else. They represent a, a religion that a lot of people love to hate. Then there's this unreligious sin. This unreligious sin. It was demonstrated by the pagans of that day. They were people that didn't want to follow God. They didn't want to follow God's ways. They just want to do everything for themselves. Some pagans would do awful things. You know, just read history. They would abuse other human beings, destroy families. But here's the thing. I really believe that most of us can identify with these two groups. We can identify with the Pharisee. Some of us have this, man, this pride, this arrogance. Or we can identify with the pagans. We don't want to do what God wants us to do. We want to go our own way. But the good news is that Jesus can transform us into something new and better. So my big question today is, how does God transform our relationships? And I want to make the case today is that Jesus fixes that inner Pharisee. And then two, Jesus fixes our inner pagan. And we'll see this in our Bible passage today. Our Bible passage was written to the first generation of Christians. When Jesus died and rose again, he went back to the Father. Now the Christians were to take up the same mission with the power of the Holy Spirit. But these Christians had serious differences. And it became a huge problem. One of the big divides in the early church was between the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles. These two groups, they lived in hostility, suspicion for like a thousand, over a thousand years. And it was a deep conflict. But again, they had to overcome their differences. So Paul, he's reminding them of what Jesus has done for them. He's creating a new family. So let's read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 15. We're going to start there. If you have your Bibles, please open it. If you do not, you can read with me. It will be up on the screen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 15, it reads, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision. Interesting group name to choose. Which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, who have been, who've been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. So my first point today is that Jesus fixes our inner Pharisee, meaning he fixes the worst parts of our inner religiosity. When I was a teenager, I was at a youth camp. It was actually this youth camp that we're going to in April. Small world, isn't it? So we were at this youth camp, and we were registering. So we were lining up, registering for the camp. And in walks a group of goths. 
piercings all over, hair like a mohawk. Everything what they wear was black. They wore trench coats. My first thought, are they at the right camp? I was like, oh gosh, are they? This is the Christian camp, right? Like, I didn't like how they dressed. It made me uncomfortable. They looked weird. I felt awkward around them the whole week. I couldn't get around it. I didn't want to talk with them for some reason. I'm just like, oh, I don't think I have anything in common with these people. I, I don't get it. So I just avoided them the whole week. Fast forward eight years later. I am a youth pastor. And I'm at this youth pastor conference in Toronto. There's like tons of people. It's like Canada wide. All these youth pastors, they come together and like, yay, hey, let's be friends. I go to this workshop. And I see one of the goths at the camp there. I'm like, what? Are you serious? So I go up to him and I ask. And thinking back, I'm like, why did I ask this question? But I asked, what are you doing here? <laughs> he didn't seem offended when I asked. But I'm like, what were they here? Like, he was for youth pastors and stuff. And he tells me that he's like entering youth ministry and he wants to reach people for Jesus. And a part of me was shocked. I don't know why. A part of me was shocked. I'm like, this guy's a Christian? This whole time, I thought maybe, you know, maybe he invited his non-Christian friend. I don't know, at camp, I don't know, but I'm like, what? Then there was a part of me that felt shame. It was as if God kicked me in the butt. He was like, I was so quick to judge. I was so quick to just look down on him because of what he wore, because of, he, because of how he looked so different from me. So I don't know where he is now. I hope he's still a Christian. So Aaron, if you're watching, I love you. <laughs> But I hope he's doing good, because uh, I'll be devastated if he's like, I'm not a Christian anymore. But sadly, it's become normal to let superficial differences divide us. You know, earlier I mentioned that the Jewish Christians divided over each other because of their cultural backgrounds. Some Christians were from a Jewish background. The other Christians were from a non-Jewish background. They were the Gentiles. The Jewish people had grown up believing that we are the true people of God. We are the chosen ones. So they obeyed the Old Testament. They followed a lot of Jewish laws, including the law of circumcision, which we just mentioned. So they looked down on anyone who was uncircumcised, like foreskins, ew, like they called them dogs. They called them all these derogatory names. It got so that the Jewish Christians were forcing, they were forcing everyone to follow Jewish customs. So if they weren't, uncir if they weren't circumcised, they weren't considered real Christians. Interesting? But this is polluting. This is polluting the whole message of the gospel because the Bible is clear. Once a person comes to faith in Jesus, they become our brother. They become our sister. They become co-heirs. They become co-workers. We become one. One family. Their relationship with Jesus demanded solidarity. 
demanded solidarity from people who were different. Different socially, different culturally, and different in any other ways. And that's an idea that directly applies to us. Some of us have been Christians for a long time. But then when a new Christian comes along, you know, and they don't have it all together, you know, maybe they look weird, maybe they think things differently, maybe they aren't very polished in their theology, some Christians freak out. They're ready. They're ready to pounce. They're ready. Get them, correct them right away. But they correct in this condescending way, like as if they're better. Looking down, it's so easy. It's so easy to see the flaws. To see the flaws. Then to see how far they've come, we look to see their flaws. You know, they don't follow all the religious traditions. But let's remember. Let's remember that the worst sinners in the Bible were religious sinners. It was the Pharisees. It was the religious people, the religious elite who constantly fought against Jesus. They fought against Jesus and then they killed him in the end. And even nowadays, I would argue, I would argue a very strong reason why people don't want to become Christians is because they see Christians give Jesus a bad name. They see the hypocrisy. Why would I want to be like that? You know, they see this judgmental, you know, prideful, arrogant person. Why would I want to be like that? So ask yourself, are you, as a Christian, just becoming more judgmental, more Pharisee-like? Just looking down on everyone, or are you stretching in ways where you love people who are hard to love? Let's be known for our love. Not by our judgmental attitudes. And when I talk about judgment, I mean the condescending, looking down on people. Because it will be a beautiful thing to the world when they see the love. When they see the love of the church breaking boundaries, breaking stereotypes. And if we keep growing in that, you know, if we keep growing that, then every Christian should have a meaningful friendship in their life. They're not going to be friends with every Christian, but they should have a meaningful friendship in their life. You know, statistics say that we are increasingly living in a culture where loneliness is growing. And some of you are like, what? How? We're so connected on our phones. We're so connected uh, through social media. But why is it that loneliness is growing? Perhaps, perhaps we could solve the problem of loneliness if we really applied this. You know, imagine a church where none of us face the worst problems of life alone. You have someone with you. Like, not only will that be good for all of us, because we need relationships, but it would show the world that this Christian stuff actually works. It's hard. I'm not going to sit here, stand up here and say, like, oh, I do this. Per-. It's hard. It's so complex. Because people's temperaments, personalities, they just they hit each other. It's just, there's so many differences, and it's hard. I get it. But we have to try. You know, just because it's hard doesn't mean, oh, well, let's just, let's just give up. We have to try. So let's lose, you know, lose our judgmental, snobby attitudes. Let's measure our spiritual progress, not by the number of religious activities that we're a part of, religious activities that I'm a part of, by all these groups in WhatsApp. Let's measure it by how we well we love people. Because a good relationship with Jesus fixes our inner Pharisee. 
but then it also fixes the opposite problem too. Which leads to my next point. Jesus fixes our inner pagan. Pagan. When I was a kid, I was, I was obsessed with watching wrestling. Like, I would call yellow page hotlines to get wrestling news. I was so obsessed with it that I would check the ratings between WCW versus WWE and see who's winning. Like, that's how obsessed I was. My favorite wrestler of all time is Hulk Hogan. That's not him, but my favorite wrestler is Hulk Hogan. I got to watch him live when SmackDown came to Calgary. It was probably one of the best experiences of my life. You know, I've never yelled at someone. You know, he rips his shirt off, and I've never yelled for a man to shirt, take his shirt off. Like, it was just like, ah! Like, me and my brother were just like, we were going crazy. And it was just, it was just an amazing experience. But my other favorite wrestler is Sting. This is Sting. If you ever watched the movie The Crow, this is how he looks. It's like so, well, crazy. Like it's like, whoa, he's so intimidating. Like look at how he has a bat and he's so eerie and dark and he just stands with like a trench coat and he just stares at people. I was like, wow. He's a great wrestler too. He would beat up the NWO. Just huge fun. Like it was just amazing. Huge fan. So I was shocked, once again, David Cade just gets shocked all the time. I was shocked when I saw him on a Christian TV show. I was like, what? And he was sharing his testimony. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to meet Sting at the Pearly Gates one day. I was like, oh, all right. Like, I was like amazed. I mean, Sting's a Christian. And he was sharing that despite all his success, he hit rock bottom. Sure, he had money, he had fame, he had a beautiful wife, children, but he got addicted to drugs. He got addicted to painkillers, got addicted to alcohol. Soon it was revealed he was cheating on his wife on the road. He said he believed in God. He believed in God, but didn't have this relationship with God. And it came to a head when Sting got divorced. And he was in deep despair. You have everything, but you don't have peace. You don't have peace. So he tried everything, and nothing worked. So in his desperation, he cries out to God. It was the only one he could cry out to. There's nothing else that could help him. So he cried out to God, and he said, God, and it says in his words, he says, God, you must come and fix me. Come and live inside of me. No more lip service. No more lip service. Show me how to live. Show me how to be a Christian, how to be a man. And God changed him. Sting got free from addiction. He got married again. He's managing to stay faithful in his new marriage. He became a new person. But this is what Jesus does for people. He transforms us. What we give him, the parts of our life that are broken, the parts of our lives that are lost, he changes us into something better, something new. We become a new person we get a new family, like I was talking about earlier. But, there's a but. We gain all those things, but we also get a new mission. We also get a new purpose. Let's read the second half of our passage, verses 18 to 22. If you want to open your Bibles, I'm going to read it again. It says this, For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus 
himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. These verses tell us that once we become Christians, we become, we also become part of something way bigger than ourselves. We gain a new purpose. We gain a new purpose because we are members of God's household. We become co-workers. We're working together for God's kingdom, for God's mission, for God's purposes. We build our lives on the Bible. We become a church community where people can meet God. And that's what Paul is saying is when he's saying we're rising to become a holy temple. We are part of something bigger than ourselves, a larger story, a bigger one. And it should be exciting. It should be exciting, but it also means that we need to change. It also means that we cannot live the same way Like we lived before. It will take discipline to live this new life. Some disciplines are for the mind. Like we need to know our Bible well. We need to study. We need to build our lives properly on God's words. Some disciplines are relational. We need to be intentional with community. Stay in community. Do not isolate isolate yourself. Do not isolate yourself. Stay within community. We need to learn how to share the gospel effectively. You know, some disciplines are for our hands. We use our skills, talents to serve, love people. We do this at our job, career, when we volunteer at church, where we help neighbors, making society great. So we need to grow in our skills to help other people. There's so much work to do. There's so much work to do. You have this mission, and it's not going to be easy because the pagan side of us wants to do whatever it wants. So we have it. We know it. We see it. We want to, oh, no, I can't. Because the pagan inside of us does not want to do what God wants us to do. It wants to do whatever it wants, whatever is most convenient, whatever is most easy, whatever is most comfortable. But we must resist that. We have a new life now. We must resist that so that we can live on mission. We've got to keep growing in some way whether in our mind, relationships, or in service, because it will be worth it. You know, just think about the person that wakes up every morning to work out. It will be worth it. It will be worth it. You know, I've been showering cold water at the end of my showers, and supposedly it helps you circulate your blood, I think. It sucks. It's very cold. I was, like, hyperventilating and stuff, but supposedly it's good for you. But the more you do it, the more disciplined you are. I did it for one minute. And I did it for two. Wow. Maybe I'll be, I don't know. But it's still, it, it's discipline. It's discipline. And it will be worth it. And these disciplines here will be worth it for us so that we can follow Jesus and have the greatest life. So as we bring everything to a close, the big idea is that God wants to transform our relationships. That first God fixes our inner Pharisee. He fixes it. He fixes our pride. If you let him, he will fix your pride. He will fix this arrogance, this arrogant attitude, this smug attitude that we all have towards other people who are different. Towards people that we might find, you know, I find lots of people annoying, and that's what I struggle with. 
But we are on the right track when we love difficult people. And it's hard. My goodness, it's hard. And second, God fixes our inner pagan. He's inviting us to a new life. It's a new life. He invites us to a new life, a new mission, a new purpose. But this new life is going to take discipline because that inner pagan, he's going to do what he wants to do. He's going to direct us in ways that we don't want, we shouldn't go. We have to have the discipline. It's not easy to do. It will be a daily struggle. It will be a time of like picking up your cross. It will be hard, but if we keep striving, striving for Jesus' mission, we'll experience a depth, a depth of friendship and an adventure, mission that is better and will be worth it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you, Father, that you have set before us a new family. People that are different, whether it's different temperaments, different cultures, different socially. But God, you've created a new family where we are supposed to love each other. But Father, some things stop us from doing this. Some of us struggle with this inner Pharisee where we're, man, we're just arrogant. We're prideful. We look down on people instead of being patient with them. We have this condescending attitude. And I pray, Father, that we can overcome that. We can give that to you. But Father, some of us that are struggling with our inner pagan that wants to do whatever it wants, you've set the way for us. We know what to do. There's just part of us that just just leading us to somewhere where you don't want, where it's contrary to what you want for us. God, help us to overcome Father, help us to love people. It's so hard to do. So, Father, give us the strength. Help us to keep persevering, to keep fighting so that we can be on mission for you. God, thank you. We'll this day to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.